This is A New Angle, a show about cool people doing awesome things in and around Montana. I'm your host, Justin Angle. This show is supported by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. Hey folks, welcome back and thanks for tuning in. Today I'm speaking with Marcel Hauser. Marcel is a road ecologist with the Western Transportation Institute at Montana State University. Yes, we have questions about how to improve these measures, but really what keeps us from being effective and implementing them at a larger scale, that is differences are in our values, perspectives, and interests. He studies the interaction between wildlife and transportation infrastructure, something anyone who's spent time on Montana's roads has likely thought about. Marcel, thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. So tell us, where did you grow up and what did your parents do? Well, I was born and grew up in the Netherlands. My dad was a, an accountant for uh, local government and my mom worked there too as a secretary. Give us the short form version of how a guy from the Netherlands ends up in Montana studying the interaction between wildlife and vehicles, essentially. Interest in nature was always in me. My parents would take uh, us, the whole family, to the Swiss Alps in a okay. summer vacation. So that's where my interest in nature came from and then also in the Netherlands. The reason I ended up in the United States is because of a woman, and Very she's good. now my wife, and it's really good. And so academically, how did that interest emerge? Most of your graduate studies were overseas, right? Yes, so master's, uh, PhD was all in the Netherlands. It was not a coincidence that I became a wildlife biologist that was always in me. Mm -hmm. It is a coincidence, though, that I got involved in road ecology yeah. starting in the mid-1990s. That was just a, an opportunity that presented itself because road ecology was a rapidly growing field in the Netherlands. And it was one of the leaders, uh, the Netherlands, in the field of road ecology because there's so many people so many roads, mm -hmm. so much habitat fragmentation. So on one hand, it's great that the Netherlands is maybe a little proud of being a leader in road ecology. On the other hand, it is easily explained because the impacts have been so severe yeah. so early. I suppose moving to Montana, realizing a totally different environment here, much more spread out, far fewer roads, and much larger ecosystems to kind of think about how the transportation system interacts with the, the, the wildlife around it and, and nature and so forth. Yep, there's many opposites. There's the, the population density, uh, there's the scale of, of the ecosystems here, the elevation, don't forget that. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, it makes me realize, knowing where I come from, knowing what the problems are, the scale of the problems, that we can prevent many of the problems here because we still have such large intact systems. And even though our population is growing and the impacts are growing, comparatively to many parts in Western Europe that are so densely populated for so long, there's much more of the impacts that can be avoided here by smart planning and learning from places where things have gone awry much earlier. Yeah, how would you categorize those impacts in general? Like what are the primary concerns we have um, when we're thinking about the intersection of transportation and, and, and wild ecosystems? I typically talk about wildlife. So specifically mm -hmm. for wildlife impacts of roads and traffic on wildlife, it starts with just taking up space. You build a road, you build a road bed, you basically clear natural vegetation, you have a natural substrate, uh, you build that road bed up, you disturb the hydrology, you take up that space, it's no longer natural habitat. It, it's not available for animals to live. They shouldn't want to live there because it's not healthy. Mm -hmm. And that's quite a bit, actually, when you think about how many roads, how many, how much road length and how wide our roads are, yep. it ends up being one of the largest land users in the United States if you add it all up. So the second thing that maybe we are most aware of is we hit animals when we drive on the roads. Yeah. So then we see dead animals along the road. What is less visible is the barrier effect. So when animals move through the landscape, they have a certain probability of reaching a place at a certain distance away. If there's a road in between, the probability that they end up at that location sure. is much reduced. So if you can't access resources on the other side of the highway, it means that you know 
the, the home range of an animal is unknown on one side rather than on both sides. You may affect seasonal migration, and you may also reduce dispersal movements where you've got animals moving long distances without the intent of returning. Mm. And these animals are extremely important from a population dynamics perspective because they can strengthen small and isolated populations, or they can recolonize areas where that species have become has, has been extirpated, basically. So those are the types of movements that you may want to protect by reducing the barrier effect. And the fourth type of effect is the, a reduction in habitat quality. If you have a road and you have a, a zone adjacent to that road, it may be a few feet, it may be a few miles wide, depending on the species and the type of impact you're talking about, there's a huge road effect zone up to a few kilometers. It can be noise, it can be light pollution, it can be chemical pollutants. It can be all sorts of things, and if you're a plant, you may respond to the runoff from the road and maybe salt, if, you, if your roads are salted. You've got salt marsh plants now growing England, but if you're a, you know, an elk, you may shy away from a road because you know, there's people and potentially hunters uh, that may want to kill you. So you have a zone of maybe of a few miles wide where uh, these animals shy away from the road. So how big of a problem is this? I mean. It's, there's there's measurable impact on human life, quality of human life, wildlife. What are we talking in terms of you know number of collisions and like how, how, yeah how big oh, of yeah. a problem is this? Well, there is between one and two million collisions with large wild mammals in the United States alone, uh, and indeed it has consequences for people and for the animals that you're hitting. We've done some cost calculations, the economics of this, which is a, a interesting business. Comp- aspect to this besides the human safety and the biological uh, conservation argument. You know, an average collision with a, with a deer costs for vehicle repairs about $4,500 or something like that. But then when you add the costs associated with the occasional human injury, human fatality, now we're talking about a total cost of about $16,000 for the average collision with a deer. Now, if you have a larger animal, uh, an elk or a moose, that value goes up substantially and talk about many tens of thousands of dollars on average with each, with each collision. And that doesn't even include the value that we might place on wildlife for the sake of wildlife. But it's really interesting when you add that all up, what the costs are of collisions and then compare that to the cost of mitigation measures. Some people say, I understand it's good for human safety when you try to reduce collisions. I understand it's good for biological conservation, at least the lives of those in individual animals. If we don't hit them, but it, I just don't want to pay it. It's ridiculous to spend money on that. And what the misconception is, is that many people assume that it costs nothing to do nothing. And that is not true. What you really should be asking yourself is, comparative cost, the cost of doing nothing versus the cost of effective mitigation measures that reduce the severity of, of your problem. And then it becomes clear that actually in many cases, it's economically speaking, the wise choice to implement effective mitigation measures rather than not. Marcel, let's get into some of these mitigation measures. I mean, many listeners are probably familiar with wildlife crossings. I'm sure this, I would assume this sort of Early mitigations were just simply fences. Talk about the brief history of the efforts that have been made to improve uh, outcomes in this space. Well, historically, we've mostly been interested in protecting ourselves. Right. So, you know, we don't want to hit an animal because it results in expensive repair costs to our vehicle and it exposes us to risk. Mm -hmm. What have we been doing? We've been putting up signs because surely if you warn people, that there are large animals in this area, there will be a benefit in terms of less collisions. And we still do that, but the evidence of these signs reducing the number of collisions is not there. In Mm. fact, the evidence that we have says it makes no difference. Okay. So that brings me to things that we like to have relatively simple answers to complex problems. Uh, It can't cost too much money, easily implemented tomorrow over long distances. Signs fit that bill, sure. that description. Put um, up some signs, simple solution. That's right, that's right. But we tend to forget to be critically evaluating and being honest with ourselves as to whether that measure actually reduces 
our problem that we set out to solve, and it doesn't. And what measures that do address the problem, most notably fences, keep the animals off the road, and then we have underpasses, overpasses, crossing structures to still allow animals to cross to the other side of the road and not have it resulting in an absolute barrier in the landscape. So that combination of measures is quite effective in both reducing collisions and maintaining connectivity for wildlife. But there is a much higher dollar value associated with that compared to, for example, signs. And what we tend to do is tend to forget that we need to be effective in addressing our problem. And we get sidetracked and focused on, well, it must be simple, inexpensive, easily implemented tomorrow over long distances. And then the fences and crossing structures, that's not it, right? And then people say there must be something else. And we keep on implementing, trying different things or dis different variations of the same thing that we know is not effective because our desires are so strong to fit those, uh, you know, those criteria that we forget to be critically thinking and evaluating as to whether it actually reduces our problem. And I would think there's sort of a, a, a human egoism in this as well, like, or, or you know, the, sort of the information deficit model too, is if we tell people the information, hey, this stretch of road is dangerous, slow down, pay attention, that you yeah. know, we are such good enough drivers, we're in such control over our domain that we can avoid sure. these pitfalls. And if somebody happens to hit an animal, it's their fault. Right, it wasn't you, and if somebody else hits it, it was their own fault. Yeah, you know, this, 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 they this could is... have been a better driver. <laughs> right, two perspectives on that. It is very nice that you are a fantastic driver and that you will not have such an incident. But on average, when we look at the numbers, that doesn't address our problem as a society. Second of all, you're wrong <laughs> proclaiming that you are such a good driver. Mm -hmm. One way to look at it is the age distribution of people who get involved in a crash, all sorts of crashes, including wildlife vehicle collisions, but not exclusively. Then we see a peak for young drivers up to about 24 years of age. Now, when you single out wildlife vehicle collisions, the peak of collisions for those young drivers is absent. And that means that you do not benefit from age and experience when it comes to wildlife vehicle collisions. So you think that your experience and knowledge actually reduces your risk. Well, on average, that's not even true. Okay. And then another way to look at it is, okay, you're gonna avoid a collision. You're driving on these rural highways. It is dark. You do not have roadway lighting. How far out can you see a large mammal on the road? Now we did some calculations on that. And for a moose to be first seen by uh, someone with say median headlights, it's about 70 meters distance. It's not very far. So what we can ask ourselves then, if you can first see that animal about 70 meters distance, how much time is involved in processing that information, seeing the animal and starting to touch the brake, that is typically about one and a half seconds to two seconds or so. Right. In that time period, you're getting closer to the animal and the distance that remains in between is getting less and less. Now then when you start touching the brakes, then your braking distance is dependent on your original vehicle speed. And you can then calculate, well, how, can, how fast can we allow people to drive to be able to avoid a collision without the animal getting out of the way and without you departing your lane? Sure. And the answer is about half the people can avoid the collision when they drive at a maximum 40 to 45 miles an hour. The other half will still hit the animal because their headlights are so poor that they didn't see it at 70 meters, they saw it at a much shorter distance. So now bring that back to our design speed of our highways, which is you know at least 70 miles an hour, maybe 80 miles or 90 miles an hour, and our posted speed limit is slightly lower, mm -hmm. between 65, 70, 80 miles an hour. If you want to reduce collisions because of speed management, that means that you have to substantially reduce your operating speed, the speed that people actually drive, substantially below the design speed and below the posted speed limit. When you do that, you create other dangerous situations because you are actually the exception. Most people will respond to a design speed of the road, which is very fast, and if you, because of speed management, substantially reduce your posted speed limit along the road, to maybe 40, 45 miles an hour. You get fast moving vehicles mostly because they yeah. still drive to speed that they feel safe. Mm -hmm. 
And some people, a minority, will drive slow and they are good citizens. They look at the, the maximum posted speed limit sign. But the mixture of slow and fast moving vehicles on the same road is associated with an increase in crashes. It's called speed sure. dispersion. Yeah, much and more it's, dangerous. Yeah, you get rear end collisions and especially on you know, two lane highways in rural areas. What do you do when you get a f- slow moving vehicle be- you know, in front of you, you get very annoyed. You take risks. Exactly. So now you got also head-on collisions with vehicles coming from the other side. So you're trying to make it safer on one hand by reducing the speed limit, but in the end, you actually redu- uh, you increase uh, the number of collisions and you you reduce the safety for people. We'll be back to my conversation with Marcel Hauser after this short break. A new angle is supported by First Security Bank. Blackfoot Communications, and UM's College of Business. Access to capital, broadband, and education are three ingredients any community needs for success. I'm Maureen Dowd of the New York Times, and you're listening to A New Angle. Welcome back to A New Angle. I'm speaking with Marcel Hauser about the intersection between wildlife and roads. So let's focus on these the things we know that that work these these crossing types of structures and fences. Talk about you know how effective are these things and mm-hmm. what do we know about their efficacy? Fences, if you design them right for the species that you want to keep off the highway, for different large mammal species, we we can be eighty to one hundred percent effective for the road length that we fence. However, in order to be that effective, we have to do this over relatively long distances. We have only known that over the last uh, maybe eight years or so. We always assume that if you fence a road, it, you know, that's effective. But that's not true. We've got fence end effects. They're always messy. Mm-hmm. Animals enter in between the fences, especially at the fence end, and they can suppress the effectiveness overall. So we have to do it at least over three miles of road length. But fences alone result in an increase of the barrier effect of the road. Sure. If you've designed the fences right, it's an absolute barrier even for mm-hmm. the target species. So that is where your underpasses and overpasses come in. And if you build enough of them in the right locations and the right dimensions for the target species, then you can actually improve the situation, improve connectivity compared to an unmitigated road where animals could cross anywhere, but they would have to do it on the same surface as the cars. But if you provide this physical separation under or over the road for the animals, then you can actually increase the number of animal movements between both sides of the highway. Yeah, and and you mentioned there, if put in the right places, how do we know where to put these things? This is very interesting because historically what we've done is we mostly look at where we hit animals and that is where the crossings are not successful, right? But if there's other road sections where we do not have a high number of collisions with these animals and you would fence there, you would think, oh, you don't need the the crossing structures there, then you now provide a barrier in an area where they were able to cross successfully in the past, right? So just when you decide on where do you build the fences Mm -hmm. and where do you build the crossing structures, you can't do that based on dead animals alone. Can we just draw that out a little bit? So you're saying that the instinctive response is to put a crossing or a fence where there seems to be a lot of collisions. Right. However, there's probably like that's a you're probably getting a lot of collisions there because animals have learned that's a good place to cross. So a lot of them cross there. And so there's a bunch of different sort of statistical issues that are kind of come into conflict here, I would think. Right, right. You know, what what our practice has mostly resulted in is we mitigate, especially there where we hit large common large mammals. Right. And that is, you know, in our area, it's deer, elk, and in the Northeast in Alaska, it's also moose, Mm -hmm. right? But when it comes to the other, one of the other impacts of roads and traffic on wildlife, the barrier effect, what about the very rare carnivores, grizzly bears, they do not dominate the data. We do hit a number of them every year in Montana yeah. and they need connectivity. But if you would enter them next to all the deer and the elk that we are hitting, the deer and the elk drown out those grizzly bears sure. or the Canada lynx or the wolverine. Those species may need connectivity even more than those common large ungulates, mm. right? So if you only let your decisions and your design process be influenced by the common large ungulates, you will actually, by definition, not address the species for which the barrier effect of roads and traffic is of greatest biological conservation concern. It's complicated 
where to put these things. I mean, because not only that, you, you've probably got the the sort of biological question of what's the optimal place to provide safe passage to the most animals, some, you know, value judgment about species. But then there's human values too. Like where can you, where can you actually pull this off and get easements and permissions and funding? You know, like, oh, how, how does, like, give us kind of a, Reader's Digest version of how the, something like that comes together to actually make one of these things. It, it is not rocket science, but it is still science. And it is very easy to deviate from a path and a set of actions that is most likely effective in addressing your problem. And that's because mm-hmm. society is complex, all these competing values and interests. And what some people think and act upon is something is better than nothing. Right. And I actually beg to differ with that. In some cases, it can actually do more damage. But you're right. It is a complex issue. You, you cannot do this without support. You need to build consensus among stakeholders. But that is really where the greatest challenge is. Yes, we have questions about, you know, technical questions about how to improve these, these measures. But really what keeps us from being effective and implementing them at a larger scale, that is differences in our values, perspectives, and interests. That is a, a big challenge that goes beyond engineering, goes beyond the biological sciences. It really goes into the realm of uh, sociology. Yeah. Are there any promising case studies that you've been associated with as far as people coming together and understanding that – you know, managing all these different values, you know, as productively as possible to make some, to contribute to some good outcome. You know, there are some fantastic examples in North America where we have large-scale implementation of these mitigation measures. In Canada, it's it's been a Trans-Canada Highway through Banff National Park and the adjacent uh, mountain parks as well. Here in Montana on the Flathead Indian Reservation, mm-hmm. Highway 93 North is another one. Snow Calamity Pass, I-90. Yeah. Uh, the Tonto National Forest in Arizona, State Route 260, uh, I-75 and State Route 29 in Florida for the Florida Panther. Fantastic world-class examples of where things have gone right and a uh, correct spatial scale. However, y- you mentioned something about you know people collaborating and getting the right spirit. This is often said that we did something fantastic here. We had the right people at the right time together. And it is often brought as something that we should be proud of. And I'm not disagreeing, but it, it is very worrying to me because it signals that it is not the result of a logical process that is mm. applied equally everywhere. So now we are basically saying we are happy and proud that we had coincidence where things go, went right. And, and that, that is silly. We should make it more of a standardized procedure and we should not make it dependent on coincidence. And in relation to that, you know, there's been recent efforts to you know, have additional sources of funding for underpasses, overpasses. You know, for example, in Los Angeles, the, 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 the overpass for many wildlife species, but including mountain lion. And a lot of private funding goes into that. On one hand, it's fantastic. You know, society cares, society shows they care, put money there. But what does that really mean? It means that when you have powerful people that are wealthy, good things happen. What about if you do not have powerful people and you do not have money? That means it doesn't happen. See, that's the problem, right? So I'm not saying it's all bad to have external funding. But what I am saying is it is bad to not think about it as an integrated way of you know, being in the business of building and maintaining roads. Yes. And I see how the framing that you're offering here keeps us focused on the actual problem. Like we're, it's so tempting to drift off of the problem and be distracted in this space. And there's an additional problem that we have is that, you know, it's very understandable that from a traditional road management perspective, we have projects. Projects are along a certain road section. Engineers are used to seeing that as a line in the landscape. But the ecological aspects of this are, uh, you know, a three-dimensional problem, mm-hmm. right? And it's 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 not just that road section. It is the surrounding landscape. It is other roads in this landscape. So how do you effectively address these problems on a landscape level where you actually have the problem for wildlife species rather than on the project level, which is a line in the landscape and 
there's only so much you can do within the right of way. Right. So this is a problem for society. You know, it's 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 good that we organize different parts of government, you know, federal and state. You know, you deal with transportation, you deal with natural resource management. But at the end of the day, you know, if 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 these divisions in responsibilities keep us from being effective, we, we have to rethink about how to organize it and how to effectively work together. If somebody listening wants to learn more about this problem and some of the solutions that are most effective, where, where would you point them? Like, what, is, this, is the research and the reports you and your colleagues publish accessible to a lay audience? Or where, where would you advise somebody to get kind of learned up on this? You know, there's been quite a few NGOs that have made have popularized the science. Uh, they have, you know, infographics. There are movies made, short documentaries on the internet too, uh, where it's all laid out in you know pretty simple terms, but they're accurate. So, uh, Marcel, as we close here, I feel like listeners have to know about your amazing wildlife photography and nature photography. You're a passionate photographer. It sort of captures a different sensibility than you approach as a scientist, I would assume. Talk about that part of your life and, and how it's not only become so important, but so you're so brilliant at it. Well, thank you. Um, I, well, yeah, what drives me is, is beauty and, and natural behavior of the animals and, and simplicity in composition, which is actually something that's very hard to accomplish. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that is, that is what I like to do. It's uh, an obsession. And... Um, I would say maybe uh, it has no boundaries. (laughs) I just uh, am mad about it. Yeah. And your camera is always with you when you're out on sites and collecting data. And which is a great way to sort of combine passions, I would assume. Yeah, there's there's multiple facets to the photography I do. Uh, In one hand, when I work outside, I typically have, you know, wide angle camera and a GPS attached to the SLR so that all the information, the coordinates are stored in the metadata. And that's for work and communicating, uh, you know, the the types of things we just discussed. Mm -hmm. But another component of this is, you know, where I strictly do wildlife and nature photography for the the cause of, you know, pursuit of beauty. And that is something that is different from the communication related to highways and wildlife. If folks want to see that pursuit of beauty, where would you point them online? Oh, to um, a website that bears my unpronounceable name. <laughs> <laughs> it might be unspellable to so many people, so we will put it in our show notes yes. for sure. Yes, that sounds good. Well, Marcel, it's been a pleasure getting to know you and your research and your passions. Uh, thank you for your work and thank you for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to A New Angle. We really appreciate it. And we're coming to you from Studio 49, a generous gift from UM alums Michelle and Lauren Hansen. A New Angle is presented by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. With additional support from Consolidated Electrical Distributors, Drum Coffee, and Montana Public Radio. Keely Larson is our producer. VTO, Jeff Amet, and John Wicks made our music. Editing by Nick Mott, social media by AJ Williams, and Jeff Neese is our master of all things sound. Thanks a lot, and see you next time.